Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Amazon QuickSight Spring Learning Series. Today, I'm so excited to uh, introduce our presenters, uh, Ying Wang, uh, Bomsi, and Sam uh, from our professional services team. Uh, my name is Jill Florent, uh, and I'm on the QuickSight Customer Success Team. And for today, if you are um, an admin of a QuickSight uh, uh, implementation, you are in the right place because we are going to dive deep on um, kind of looking at business intelligence operations and specifically porting content. Uh, so today, um, I just wanted to call out that there are a few prerequisites that we'd like for you to have in place to be able to take advantage of uh, the activities that we're going to be going through. Of course, anyone is welcome to just listen in, but you'll get the most out of this if you're also going to be able to follow along and uh, kind of try some of the things out that we're talking about today. So in addition to an AWS account that has access to QuickSight, Athena, Lambda, and S3, it would be great if you have a basic knowledge of Python, and then a couple things that uh, that enhance things related to uh, SAML and OpenID Connect, SSO kind of thing. So just wanted to, to flag that. If uh, if that sounds good, you're in the right place. Uh, we are going to be uh, spending most of the time really um, hearing from Ying uh, and the ProServe leads. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. We are gonna try and get as many questions answered during today's session as possible. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a GoToWebinar panel that does have a question area. Um, that's a great place for you to post your questions and we'll be updating answers there uh, as quickly as we can. I did wanna also flag that within QuickSight, we have our own community. So in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, uh, that's a good place to post questions and get answers after today's session. Um, I also wanted to call out, we will be recording it. Um, we will aim to have the recording posted to our QuickSight YouTube channel by the end of the week. And um, we will be posting some items in the chat window on the right side um, to give you the content references for today's session. So they're noted here, and then I'll post those shortly in the chat. Uh, but this will give you access to the APIs, CloudTrail, and, um, and the uh, CDK that you'll need to follow along in depth. Um, and without further ado, I would love to say that I'm gonna turn things over to Ying Wang. Uh, Ying is a very, um, in-depth expert on all things data analytics. She leads our global professional services practice for QuickSight and has helped many of our large customers uh, unlock the power of data with QuickSight uh, over the past couple of years here at AWS. She's a, a real leader in uh, what can be uh, done with QuickSight. We also will be hearing from Sam who is uh, very in-depth on DevOps and also helps with the ProServe team on the global delivery practice. And from Vomsi, also a uh, very in-depth background on um, not only analytics, but uh, Redshift migrations, Data Lake, et cetera. And so without further ado, I'd love to go ahead and turn it over to Ying, who can go through more of the in-depth agenda for us. So give me just one moment to turn things over to Ying. And um, I will be happy, uh, Ying, to make sure that uh, if you just go ahead and share your screen and test your mic, I'll make sure that everybody can hear you. Yeah, thank you, um, Gio. Thank you very much. Great. We are seeing your screen and I'm able to hear you. So go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, let's start the uh, play. Uh, here is today's agenda. 
we will do some introduction about the BI ops combined BI uh, and operations. And we will simply explain the QuickSight dashboard development workflow. Um, and we will talk about the programmable migration across different accounts and different AWS regions. And we will simply introduce how to utilize folder to organize QuickSight assets, QuickSight objects. And we will expand the workflow to do the dashboard version control in one account. Um, and we will introduce QuickSight API and provide some links uh, about how to learn about QuickSight API. And we will explain the sample notebooks workflow of the migration scripts. And then Lancy will conduct a demo uh, about the notebook migration. And then we will do the Q&A for notebook solution. Um, and then Sam will do the CDK introduction. Uh, and then Sam will talk about uh, high level overall solution of the uh, CDK solution. In the CDK solution, we introduce a simple web page to be the UI interface of the migration tool. Uh, and in back end, we convert the code in the migration uh, scripts into different lambda function. Um, and the CDK just uh, to, to deploy the lambda function easily and quickly uh, in the CICD pipeline uh, and uh, package them together. Uh, and then Sam will explain the different functional CDK stacks. And then Vancy will do the demo of the UI solution. And then we will go to the Q&A for the CDK solution. And uh, yeah, and that's it. And feel free to post your question uh, in, the, uh, in the chat window. Uh, we will try to answer it as soon as possible. Thank you very much. So uh, we all understand DevOps very well. Uh, that's the development combined with the operations. We do the planning, we log the requirement into Jira Tiki or whatever place. And then SDE go to do the coding and then we build the package uh, and then we run some unit test. And once we pass uh, the UAT test, we will release uh, the application, the software, and we deploy the solution, uh, and then we do the maintenance uh, for the daily operation, and we also monitor the usage, the problem of the application we already release, and continue to do it in a CI CD, continue integration, continue development pipeline um, to do the seamless development and deployment uh, software development life cycle. And we borrow the idea of DevOps into BI uh, terminology. For the BI, uh, I believe everyone, uh, the attendee in this session are experts of BI. Usually we collect the user requirement and then we do the UX UI design. And once we finish the UX UI design, we will discuss with data architecture, uh, DBA to do the data modeling. And once we have the data modeling uh, ready, we will develop the data set, develop the dashboard, and we also run the test. And then we release the dashboard, uh, deploy into the production environment. And we also have to do the daily maintenance and monitor the dashboard usage. And we would like to make the uh, BI ops also as a pipeline to be seamless uh, CI CD workflow. And for the other BI software, it's difficult to do that. But for QuickSight, um, luckily, QuickSight provides comprehensive API support. And QuickSight it is a native AWS service, so we can very easy to integrate with the other AWS service to build a serverless uh, solution. Um, and you might already know uh, several weeks ago, QuickSight released the cloud formation support. Um, and by the end of this year, QuickSight will introduce the assess as code uh, support. And, and at the same time, we have the folder 
uh, objects already, and we will release for the API soon. So it is a perfect timing to introduce, deploy it, um, and design the BI op solution into your enterprise uh, BI architecture. And um, every one of you very familiar with the so-called self-service analytics. That terminology it is uh, for the reader and for the author um, to do the data analytics by themselves by uh, running the pixel analysis and do the selection and dashboard and so on and so on. And with the API support with the other AWS service um, and all of you, the BI experts, combine a little bit program uh, language uh, knowledge, then you can do the self-service BI administrative. Um, you don't have to rely on uh, the other team to design a complicated and uh, useless uh, admin structure. You can just use QuickSight itself combined with the other AWS service to build the self-service business intelligence administration and DevOps. Um, there's no limitation. Uh, the only limitation is your imagination. Um, you can understand that in the following up um, solution we introduced. And um, here, let's talk about the uh, QuickSight BI application development cycle. Uh, we use Namespace to isolate, to segregate the different user group. Um, and uh, in different namespace, the user can only see, can only share the dashboard and data sets to the user, to the user group in the same namespace. So it is perfect for ISV uh, BI users. So in the namespace, you can create uh, QuickSight users, and then you can create a QuickSight group, and then you can assign the user into different QuickSight group. Uh, to be different uh, business domain, to be different low level security, color level security, uh, whatever you would like to do. Um, and then once you finalize the security architecture, you can start the, uh, to create the data source. Data source is nothing, it's just uh, objects can save the uh, data connection credential so that you can reuse it. You don't have to re-enter your credential every time. You can just create one time and then reuse it again and again. And once you have the data source, um, you can create a data set. Data set, it is a uh, uh, quick side object, contain the data. You fetch your data from data warehouse and save into data set in memory. That's SPICE data set. SPICE means super uh, faster parallel uh, in memory uh, computational engine. Um, and when you save the data in memory, you can imagine that the performance will be much better compared to you get the data from every time from the uh, data source by running the lifetime query. And uh, besides Vice, QuickSight also provide the direct query data set. So every time you can just get the live data from the database uh, directly. So that's the two types of QuickSight data set. And for the user group, for the data source, for the data set, everything is doable from UI and from API. Uh, both of the two methods are available. And once you have the data set ready, you can set the refresh schedule. Uh, and you can also call the API to check the ingestion status. And, um, and then you can develop your analysis. Unfortunately, this step now is still only manual uh, process and only uh, available from the UI. Um, there's this the only step you have to do it manually. Uh, it cannot be do uh, automatically with programmable way. And once you have the analysis ready, you can create the template. Let's say you are developer the analysis in your um, dev account. So once you finish your development, you call the create a template API to create a template in your dev account. And then in the 
testing account, UAP account, or production account, you can call the create a dashboard API to create a dashboard by using the template in dev account. And then you can call the API of run the UI to share the dashboard um, to different user, different user group. And um, you can call the API to list and describe your dashboard and list and describe the dashboard permission for your uh, monitoring, uh, for your uh, user management control. And another API, it is for streaming. Uh, for the dashboard, even if you already publish it, you can still call the streaming API to change the streaming. It will be applied to the uh, all the dashboard and analysis if it is available there. So that's the dashboard development or we should say BI application development workflow. Yeah, and how to do the migration uh, across accounts programmably. Let's assume that you already have two accounts. One is dev account, one is production account. In these two accounts, you already set up subscribe to QuickSight service, and you already config the connection between uh, the data source and the QuickSight. For example, data source can be a Cinda, Redshift, RDS, whatever you want. But let's assume that you already set up uh, the uh, database, the data warehouse service already. And then you would like to migrate the QuickSight objects from your dev account to your production account. How could you do that? You call the QuickSight API to list the data source in your development account. And then you can design a loop uh, to, or you can design some keywords, or you can design like a use tag, or in future you can use folder to identify the data source you would like to migrate from dev account to production account. And then um, we write the sample Python scripts for you to update uh, the data connection information in the uh, data source. And how could we do that? Because we can describe the data source in dev account. And when we call the describe data source API, we get the return as a JSON stream. And in the JSON stream, you can replace the data credential information with the target account information. And then you can use this updated data source information to recreate the data source in the production account. Um, this explanation, just a high level uh, explanation, we will go through the detail in the notebook solution uh, later. And once you have the data source ready in your production account, then now you can use the same methodology to describe data set by using the API and then update the information uh, with the target account information and replace the data source ARM in the data set from source account, I mean the dev account to the uh, target account, it is uh, the production account. And with this updated data set information, you can recreate data set in the target account, which is the production account. And then you can do the same thing um, to set the refresh schedule. And then you can check the ingestion status, whatever you would like to do. And once the ingestion successfully, um, you see, okay, I have data in my production account, in my target account. Then I can create template in the dev account. And then we can create analysis or dashboard from this remote template in dev account, we create the analysis dashboard in production account by using the remote template in dev account. And if you would like to do like a create analysis firstly, then you can call the create dashboard API 
to create a dashboard in the target account. And then you can call the API to share the dashboard um, with specific user and group. And you can also apply the theming. You might want, if you have any customization theming, you can also migrate the theme from source account to target account and then apply the new theme in target account to the dashboard in your target account. And that's it. That's the migration across accounts programmably workflow. And similarly, you can change the solution a little bit to make it to be across different AWS regions. Just change the uh, ARN from different account to different region. That's it. It's very easy. And now we understand how to migrate across account. We can talk about the QuickSight folder a little bit. QuickSight folder can help you greatly in the if you only have one account, but you would like to do the version control in one account, how could you do that? The QuickSight folder can help you greatly for this solution. And not only that, if you still would like to the multiple account uh, migration, QuickSight folder can also help you to organize your dashboard, your data set into different uh, segments. Um, here you click link, you will learn about the QuickSight folder. So you can create a folder um, by the different development stage. For example, you can create a folder called dev, another called test, another called production. And in one account, you can separate the uh, dashboard data sets into different release stage. You can also create a folder um, based on the bis different business usage, like marketing, sales, HR, uh, whatever you would like to do. Um, and, and then when you segment the objects into different folder, you can right mouse click uh, the dot 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 button to share the folder to different user and different group. And for the dashboard data set, you can also click the three dots button and add those objects into a folder. Just be careful when you do add to a folder, um, it is not means you move the objects into the folder. You just build a relationship between the folder and the dashboard or the data sets. It's a many to many relationship. You can assign the objects into different folder and one folder can contain different objects. And once you build a relationship, you can do the version control by using the folder you can also, when you do the migration, uh, you can just modify, update the uh, Python scripts we provide to you a little bit to specify like, uh, I only want to migrate the dashboard inside one of the folder. Don't care about the other folder. So it's very powerful. Uh, for now, uh, folder is only available in UI, but after the folder API release, you can do this uh, workflow by specifying the different folders. And <clears throat> yeah, once we understand the folder, then it's very easy to do to the dashboard version control in one account. Let's say you only have one account. You don't have to uh, specify, config, multiple quick side account. You don't want to do that. But you do want to, to do the version control in this one single account. How could you do that? So you create analysis, which is version one, and you might create it into the dev folder. And then you publish a dashboard and your QA team or your end user uh, would like to test, do the UAT test of this dashboard. And at the same time, you use the create template API to create the uh, template. And be careful now is your version one template. And after you publish a dashboard, okay, your QA team run the test. And uh, after the QA team finish the test, whatever successful or fair, you have to go back to update your analysis. This step is manually to, to do it. If successful, you might want to continue develop your analysis to add more features, add more visualization. If it is fair, then you might want to fix those bugs. So anyway, you have to update your analysis into version two. And once you have version two, 
and you publish dashboard again, and which it is your version two dashboard. And now you run the QA test again. If it is passed, okay, great. You update your template to be the version two. And if it is failed, and there's no way to manually return to the previous status, no worry, you have your backup, your version one template. So you just roll back your analysis uh, to version one by using the version one template. And then you can go back to the development cycle to do the update analysis again. And you can continue to do it, to do it, to do it. And with the folder support, and in future the folder API support, you can make this workflow to be more organized by locating those objects into different folder according to your requirement. And here we will um, quickly introduce the QuickSight API. And QuickSight API, if you would like to see the introduction, you can go here and you can uh, learn about um, the different uh, QuickSight API. You can go to the uh, reference index to go to see any action you can do. Uh, for example, create a group and you can see, okay, it's a post request. And uh, how could you do that? What's the parameter required? And what's the request body? And by using this one, um, you can just from the CLI uh, interface to run it, to learn about those um, API. And if you understand Python, perfect. You can go to uh, use the, you can create a lambda function or glue scrapers or whatever. You can use Fargate to contain um, a Python uh, software application you build by calling bottle three. For example, we speak about create a template multiple times. So what's the create a template? This one just, you just configure the QuickSight client and then call this API say create a template. And by providing the account ID and by providing a template ID, you specify and by providing template name and provide the permission, which means principle it is who, uh, for example, your QuickSight admin can do what action here. Um, and you can specify what's the source entity of this template. It can be an analysis. So you provide the AIN of your source analysis and you provide the data set reference. Um, in here, it's just a placeholder. You just provide a dummy name. And in here is the real data set AIM here. Um, and then uh, another way to create a template, it is to use template as a source to create another template. Um, usually when we say copy template, it is to do it by using this one. And of course you can apply tag, but tag it is optional. And you can describe the version of your template. And once you run this uh, API request and QuickSight will create a template for you and you will get the response um, as a JSON stream. And we will tell you, hey, what's the AIN of your template? And um, what's the template ID and the creation status in progress or successful? Um, or creation fair, um, and we return you the state, status code. Um, and just uh, for your information, um, now QuickSight support a public template. That means once you create a template, you can say allow everyone to describe your template, then everyone can download your template. You can release a template to public if you are working in the um, uh, non-profit organization or if you are a scientist, you would like to release um, your uh, visualization into your uh, community, then you can create template and then release to everyone. Everyone can download it. And um, here it is a beautiful, um, oh, sorry, there's another problem. I will update the, um, I will update the uh, the link later. Um, you can go to um, here in this uh, Learn QuickSight demo center. 
um, the QuickSight Solution Architect team to a beautiful work uh, to introduce all the feature and the demo and uh, the tips and, and tricks uh, about everything, not only the API usage, but also the different workshop about the embedded authoring and so on and so on. And you can learn some concrete API usage example here. It is very good. I like it a lot. I will update the link. Sorry, I have an uh, old link here. And <clears throat> here it is the migration script sample. Um, here it is uh, the workflow here. Um, and if you click the link, we provide the GitHub repo uh, to all of you. Um, and you can see all the information here. And for the notebook, we provide three different notebook. One notebook, it is the function notebook. And we provide the batch migration and the incremental migration. Um, for the batch migration means whatever you have in your source account, we just migrate everything into target account. For the incremental migration, that means you provide your migration list uh, and then we look for those specific uh, objects and we only migrate those objects. Um, and how could we do that? We do that as we expand the QuickSight API. Um, we create this function notebook. In this notebook, we create a bunch of uh, functions to do the describe objects. We can describe data source, data set, theme analysis, dashboard, and template, and the permission of these objects. And we create a bunch of functions to do the create objects. And we create a bunch of functions to do the update objects. And we create the function to do delete objects. And also, we can list objects. And we create the supportive functions to connect those single those together into a con new continuous pipeline to make it to be a, a workflow. That's what we have in the function notebook. And then in these two different notebook, the batch migration and the incremental migration, we import those functions. And in and, and the beginning, you do the configuration, like config your, uh, source account, target account uh, permission by config the different admin user in different account. And you can also config the credential of your, for example, your Redshift data warehouse. How can you connect to the uh, Redshift data warehouse? And once you finish the configuration, we will list the data source in the batch migration. We list every data source and we update the data source connection information by using the data warehouse credential. And then we create it one by one in target account. And then we do the similar step for data set, for uh, scene for analysis, for dashboard. And for the incremental migration notebook, what we do is a little bit complicated. Of course, you still have to do the configuration and then you provide a list of the dashboard you would like to migrate. Um, and we call the function in the function notebook to get the data source, the data sets of those dashboard you would like to do a migration. And then we migrate the data source, the underlying data source of the dashboard. And similarly, we migrate the underlying data sets of the dashboard. And then similarly, we migrate the dashboard. Um, and you can even further to also migrate the analysis of this dashboard from source account to target account. And you migrate the me to reapply the theme. Um, and in the incremental migration uh, notebook, you can also do like, a, I don't want to migrate dashboard. I only want to migrate data source or data sets. It's also doable. You just specify the different parameters to do the different type of migration. And this one is the explanation of the migration notebook. And now, uh, Wednesday, I will transfer um, the presentation to you and Wednesday will run the demo to uh, all of us. And sure. let me start the sharing. 
and when say, are you able to do the um, sharing? Yeah, I'm just yeah. going to do that. Yep, yeah. okay. Let me if you guys can see my screen. I can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah, thanks. I also uh, can see. Good, okay. Yeah, so uh, for the for the migration, uh, let's first go over, quickly go over the GitHub link. So as Ing explained, uh, you have a batch migration, incremental migration, and functions. So so basically, pretty much for this lab, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a batch migration as part of this one. That means uh, I have a source account. So the source account is here, and if you see, this is a quick, quick site central. That's my source account. And in Quicksight Central account, uh, there are in general we have like five different objects, right? One is the data source. So in this case, if I look into the list of data sources, we have a RDS data source, Redshift, and Ethereum. So there are three different data sources available in the source account. And when we look into the data sets, so there are four different data sets built on top of those data sources. And going to the analysis, so I have four different uh, analysis built. And if I, for example, if I take the first one, Web Social, which is built on top of Redshift, you can see like uh, there is a filter in place. Uh, I'm just trying to showcase all these things so that when we migrate, we want to validate all these things and make sure like all these replicate as is. So there is a filter in place. And if you go to the themes, there is some new theme called my new theme is applied on this particular dash analysis. So this is a theme which that's basically changing the background color uh, and couple of uh, you know text color to you. So that's a new theme I applied on this. And when you go to the uh, the second one, weather data analysis. So if you go to the theme, uh, you will see like there is some separate theme called my theme two applied on this data set. So we have two analysis so far, and for the third one, there is no theme but there is an action filter in place so for example like if i click on uh, california you can see like the below chart is filtering out for california so there is some action filters are in place for this analysis and the third or well, the fourth one is uh, pretty much only for this account so this table no, don't even exist in the other account so this is more around uh, showing the objects which are available in this quick site account and this table is coming out of athena and this is not even there in the target account actually at this point of time so that's the four analysis we have. And for those four analysis, there are four corresponding dashboards developed. So that's the whole inventory we have in the source account. So we have four different data sources, oh sorry, three different data sources, four different data sets, four analysis, and four dashboards. And if we quickly flip to the target account, which I opened in a different browser, and it's my QS target account. In this account, if I go to the data sources, it's pretty much empty. There's nothing created data sources which are available. And same way for data sets, it's empty. Analysis is nothing and dashboards is also nothing. So it's a, it's a brand new account we just created. And it, it, it we subscribe for the quick site, but there is no objects available in this account. So this is the very first time you're going to migrate the objects from your source account to the target account. Now, if you flip to the uh, source account, basically, as we saw, like uh, into the, the same notebooks, what we saw in the GitHub, I just downloaded those into the Jupyter lab in my local account. So now I do see like all those three files, like match migration, incremental and functions. And now, as you see, like in the source account, we have the RDS, Redshift and Athena, so basically the data sources. And to migrate into target, you have to provide those credentials. Basically, the Redshift RDS credentials are required. Uh, because those are like a, uh, you should have an endpoint host name username password all this different stuff so as we're doing a batch migration so in the batch migration if you scroll a little bit down there you should be mentioning in one of the cell like hey what did the rds uh, you know uh, host name what is the redshift host name or database name cluster id and same way you're going to provide the redshift credentials rds credentials everything in this particular phase so you, you got to feel this when you download the template from the github you have to fill this template exactly like what is mentioned here. For the RDS, you're gonna give that uh, endpoint. For the Redshift, you're gonna give all these different parameters. And again, you're gonna give the credentials for the RDS and credentials for the Redshift. And the other thing is, uh, you need to make sure like you have a admin accounts from both source and target accounts. 
So I'm going to mention, hey, in my source account, what is my uh, admin user ID? And in the same way, in the target, what is my admin user ID? So these are your quick site admin user IDs which are present in the quick site. And the last input which you also need to provide is your uh, profiles which you might have set up in your EC2 or in your local. So in my case, I set up a profile. So I'm going to give those profile names like QS source and QS target as my profile names, which in turn are nothing but your IAM user uh, related profile names. And other way to do is you can do through a role as well. So in my case, I picked up the doing by user user level and you can also do a role. So if it is a role, then you're going to uh, uncomment this and you're going to mention the role name exactly what you what you have right now to assume. And that role should have enough access on the quick site to, to, to do the job. So that's the only input parameters we're going to mention. And once the input parameters are filled in, then first thing is you have to create all these base functions, the bunch of base functions like you know uh, listing the data sets, all, all these different uh, functions. What you see here, uh, basically one is listing the data sources, data sets, describing them. And if in case we have to delete any object, then we should have that in place. And then creation or updation. So you should have all these different uh, functions that need to be created first. And it require about a three uh, you know uh, library. If in case if in case in your local or in your mission, if you don't have the Boto3, uh, then in the batch migration, as a very first step, there is an install step of Boto3. You can actually go ahead and run that first and then come back to the functions. If in case that is coming as an error for you saying like, hey, that Boto3 library is not available. So for this lab, let's go ahead and run this all the uh, functions. I'm going to click on run and click run all cells. So that in turn actually it's completed. So we were able to create all the functions which are base for us now i'm going to the batch migration so in the batch migration the process is pretty much like first we're gonna uh, migrate the data sources and then we're gonna get the data sets analysis list and then migrate those data sets then get the list of themes what you have and then migrate them and then followed by analysis migrate them and then followed by dashboards and migrate them so that's the whole process what's going to happen so let's kick all this let's trigger all the cells here so right now, uh, as you see, like all these things are running and I do have all the all the required, you know, Boto3 and PP installed already. So it says like it's already available and the rest of the job is happening now. And if you quickly look in, uh, it's right now at migrating the data sources step that is executed. And as that is done, uh, actually it is writing in this step, basically you're, it's going to create a folder for you called uh, migration and uh, in the migration report you're going to have like success and failure two kind of folders available in your local where actually you can go and look into the log so let me uh, let me go back to the target account and see like what happened with the data sources as that is migrated so going to the data sets and click on new data set and you can see like in the target account right now i'm in target account you can see like all these three came like just few seconds back and if I click on the Athena, uh, that's your Athena connection. And if you try to create a new data set out of it, it automatically shows up with your current target account, uh, whatever the tables are available in that. So it's automatically showing up those. That means the, the, the Athena connection is working good. Same way, if I go to the RDS and create a data set, it automatically shows up all the list of tables what it have. So it actually taken the credentials, the endpoint, everything from your notebook and was able to create it data data source in your target account same way if i go to the redshift and yes it shows up the tables which are available in the redshift in your target account i think by this time we should be done with the migration of data sets as well yep migration of data sets is done so we can go ahead and validate that going back to the target account here's target and click on the data sets Yep, you can see like all those four data sets came. So let's start from the web social and you can see like even the refresh is done. So it actually connected to the redshift and even the first refresh has been done for this. And let's see the weather, even that's done. US population, even that is done. And as I told like object access, I didn't create the table. So you will see like there is error that's expected because we don't have this table created in Athena in the target account. But you can see like the data set and data, data set got migrated, but not the the SQL query was not working basically. Now going back and let's look into the analysis. If uh, So it's right now in the analysis phase. 
and in the analysis phase you can see like uh, you have four analysis to do so it's kind of printing one by one as and when one is done and other part is basically as i told like in the local folder uh, let's go to that uh, local So you can see this migration results folder which is get created as part of this notebook and if i go to the migration results you should see two folders called failure and success and if you go to failure then you should see something for this current run like which is happening right now all these four files last four files and you can see like if any error happens or you know anything wrong with your permissions then you're going to see all those error messages in these files so it will create for each object as a separate file so you can select data source as one file analysis another data set theme so you'll have different files for each and for each execution you're going to see different files basically and same way for the success as well you're going to see like different files uh, for each run so so you can actually look in and figure out if something going wrong with those and right now i see like analysis is done so we can go back and verify so there are four analysis showing up here and let's refresh this space Yep, so I see all the four analysis. Uh, the first one I'm going to ignore. Okay, anyways, that's not going to work, the object one. And let's start with web social. And for this, we have a separate theme. That's one thing to identify. So if I go to the theme, yes, I see that my new theme came over and it actually got applied as well. And uh, also the other thing is there is a filter. Yes, that's in place. And also like as it connected to target account, you see like the data is different. It's not the same data. Maybe it's in production, you have a different data, right? So in your source account, you might see a different number, whereas in target, it's different because it's a different data set in different environment. And let's go to the US population. And it should have a action filter in place. So let's click on California. And yes, I do see like the action filters are coming up along right in the right way. And next one is the weather one. Weather have its own theme. So yes, that theme got applied here. I can see that my theme two got applied here. So everything is good with the analysis. And let's go and see if dashboards are done. Yeah, everything is done with this. So now if you go to the migration of dashboard, it printed like basically, hey, there is a template created as Inge explained before, it's gonna create a template and via the theme it's gonna, via the template it's gonna migrate the dashboard. So you can see like there are four dashboards that got created here. And let's verify those dashboards as well one time. So when I go to the web social, yes, the theme is in place. Everything is good with the web social. And uh, weather, weather should have the theme in place. Yes, that's good. And the next one is population dashboard. And in which the action filter should be in place. So maybe I'll pick up Texas this time. And yes, I do see data there coming filtering out. So all the, all the four migrations happen, like you can see like the, the data sources, data sets, analysis, dashboard, and theme. All the five different objects got migrated into your brand new account in the target side. So that's how basically you perform a batch migration, which is very first time. And quickly to show the incremental migration file, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to execute it, but I'll show you the difference between these two in terms of what parameters you have to pass in. So the very first thing is, yes, you're gonna pass that uh, the profiles, either the profile with region, or you can pass the role, any one of these required to pass. One should be for the source, one should be for the target. So that's what you're gonna pass in either in these two cells for your role, or you're gonna pass here that uh, profile names. And the second thing is your admin account in your source, in the quick site admin user ID in your source, and the same way from your target, that's another parameter you're gonna pass. And the third is uh, the Redshift and RDS, whatever databases you have, you need to pass those. Uh, again, this one should be a complete endpoint, like how we have in the batch migration. Uh, and you should have the Redshift, uh, the cluster ID, host name database, and the corresponding credentials. You're gonna pass all that information. And the additional step here is uh, this. So here, if you see like, hey, what do you want to migrate? Do I want to migrate a dashboard or analysis or data set? Like, you can pass anything, right? Whatever you need. So you have these other options, all, source data set theme analysis dashboard so you're going to mention what you want to migrate and you're going to fill this for example in my case i want to migrate like uh, you know i can say all and i can give the list of analysis and list of dashboards that's what i'm going to provide here 
with a comma separation list. Then when I do that and it trigger this, for example, if I do all here and trigger it, then what it do gonna do is it's gonna migrate the dashboard. And for dashboard, there will be some dependent objects, right? So if it, if it is a dashboard, then obviously we need the data set, we need the data source, all these things to be in place. So dashboard actually go and figure out all those dependencies and it migrate everything. Same way, the analysis is also gonna do the same job. Uh, the data sets and data sources it will identify and it will migrate those objects as well. So th these are you're going to do incremental migration basically. And rest of the code remains same. Like these are the only parameter inputs which you need to change when you take the code from GitHub. Uh, I think I'm done with the lab here, uh, Ying. So do you want me to pass it back? Sorry, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Uh, okay, yes, um, yeah, yeah. Um, then uh, next we can go to the Q&A session. Um, and in the Q&A session, um, actually we already received um, two questions. One question it is, are these migrate uh, a data dataset across account? The answer is yes those migration is across account. And the second question it is, um, do we have the uh, glue catalog table in each account? And the answer is yes. In this demo, uh, when they just did, uh, we already pre-config the Asina table into different account. We only do the migration for the quick side data source and data sets, but if we would like to integrate. And actually this one is an excellent question. I like this question. Um, that's exactly, we would like to introduce this class with all of the QuickSight users. It is naturally, it is natively, we would like to combine the data warehouse migration and the BI migration together as an end-to-end -end workflow. So, if we would like to do like a firstly, we migrate the Asina table or Redshift table. And once the table migration is successful, we move to the QuickSight datasets migration. That's the, that, that's, of course, that's the best practice and workflow we would like to recommend. And for you to do that, actually you could do like a, in Glue, you have, ideally you have a job there to create those table in your target account. And once your job successful, you can put the migrated QuickSight dataset as another job in Glue. And then uh, once the first job successful and you trigger the QuickSight migration Glue job and make it as a pipeline. You can also um, still keep the Lambda function workflow once you finish your ETL and then trigger the Lambda function to do the migration in BI application. That's either way is doable. And furthermore, for Asina, if you really would like to discover it as uh, the cloud formation template solution is also doable. I have a sample uh, in the GitHub repo um, for another solution. I provide the example. Um, the example it is I created three different uh, cloud formation template. The first uh, template, it is calling the Lambda function to generate the data in S3 bucket. And the second cloud formation template, it is create a SINA table by using those outputs in S3 bucket. And third template, it is create QuickSight objects once you finish the table migration. Um, you can make those cloud formation template as a pipeline, as a workflow to do it. I mean, either way is fine, just depends on uh, the pros and cons and the requirement of your organization. Um, hopefully I answer this question. And for third question. Uh, sorry, uh, I have an issue to open the question channel. Yes. I don't know what the question is. Uh... Yeah. Basically, um, yes. accessing the uh, you know the Athena across accounts. So basically, you have uh, Athena table created in one account. So and can we access oh, you, from a different yeah, account? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you can access uh, across account. Uh, in in if you have multiple uh, account, um, I mean this one is out a little bit out of the scope of this discussion, but that's definitely doable. Um, in one account, you have all your data in the S3 bucket, and then you configure the security access um, to open the access to another AWS account. Then your QuickSight application in another AWS account can access this S3 bucket to get the information, to get the uh, file in the S3 bucket. That's definitely doable. When you go to the security configuration of your QuickSight account, you can see um, there's uh, uh, for the S3 bucket, there's an option to select the S3 bucket outside this uh, account you are using. You have the option. That's definitely doable. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah but not via Athena, right? It has to be a S3 data source in that case. Yeah, this one, uh, it is S3 uh, yeah. uh, access. But for the yeah. Athena, you cannot do a cross account. Yeah. 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 But you can have the data in the S3 in the other account, but you have to run your glue or Athena again in the cross account to create the tables against that cross account S3. Then that's where you can do it. Yeah. But yeah, not the Athena, you know, it's basically like the glue catalog cannot be shared across accounts. If no further question, do we want to move to next topic? And I just posted the GitHub link into the um, um, question uh, window. One, it is for the migration scripts we are demoing today. And another one is for the cloud formation template support uh, for another solution, but you can reuse it. Um, yeah, thank you. And, uh, yeah, and, and Sam, do you want to jump in to do the uh, next uh, topic? Yeah, certainly. Um, I will. Okay, I should be sharing my screen now. Okay, yes. so great. Just confirming. Um, oh, thank you, Joe. Um, so I'm going to focus more on our proof of concept that we worked on to um, show what's possible uh, with QuickSight and um, some of the scripts that we've highlighted so far. Um, we wanted to uh, create, we wanted to present users, um, business intelligence engineers and data engineers, whoever is using QuickSight. Uh, easier way to interact with um, the data database micro or sorry QuickSight dashboard analysis um, migration um, and keep them solely in an, in a UI that's not SageMaker notebooks or Lambda functions um, and so uh, thinking sort of outside the box we're like okay well here's here's um, we, maybe a simple website that just takes some input, input and then does perform some migration for us so th that's that was sort of the original goal. So along with the notebooks, um, we wanted to um, provide these, um, provide the code that deploys all of this from our GitHub and you'll find it available in the link that we just provided. Um, we'll soon have a blog post that will cover this end-to-end -end deployment. Um, uh, so you, you can perform this in your own environment um, and also uh, use the GitHub right now to try and do it yourself. Um, so, uh, like I said, our goal was to create a simple UI with an embedded QuickSight dashboard that displayed the status and details of all of our currently active dashboards in our environment, as well as other resources like analyses and themes and such. Um, the web UI um, would need to accept parameters for source and destination accounts, as well as regions, um, and uh, perform the kind of the migration that we've uh, displayed through the notebook. Um, but 
completely hands off. You just want to click submit and it goes and does stuff. Um, and then what, when you do click submit, we want it to communicate with an API gateway in the back end. And that API gateway will go and perform the necessary triggering of Lambda functions um, and then ultimately perform that migration. Uh, and then at the very end, as a feedback loop, we want to have our embedded dashboard updated with the with the status of our dashboards um, that we we're, we currently have available to us and the analyses and possibly even more content. Um, uh, but it, in our current POC, we, we provide a meager set of data just so we can show what's possible and it's easily uh, updatable depending on your use case and what you really want to see there. So in order to uh, what, what we decided originally was um, let's uh, let's provision all of these resources um, through infrastructure as code. Now we decided that let's do act, let's actually perform all of these through CDK. It's our cloud development uh, kit uh, that AWS provides, and CDK is a software development framework from AWS. It, it allows developers to define cloud infrastructure in their favorite modern programming language. Um, and uh, as you can see, we have Python, uh, C Sharp, uh, Java, Go, and TypeScript. So uh, fairly extensible. Um, uh, and uh, these projects uh, are executed to generate cloud formation templates. And infrastructure is also deployed using AWS CloudFormation. So when you use, when you write these constructs or when you write this, uh, these applications, um, you write that in your programming language, you synthesize it into CloudFormation templates, then those templates are then ingested by AWS CloudFormation to actually provision the necessary infrastructure. So it actually provides a very um, uh, uh, tight coupling with uh, CloudFormation, unlike other, uh, other uh, infrastructure as code that's available to you, like Terraform or some of the other ones uh, out there. Um, now, it also gives you the opportunity to um, reuse constructs that are published by people in your team, people in your company, or even others that are outside of your, uh, outside of your company um, in the community. For example, uh, with our solutions architects, we have a construct library that provides users with super well vetted and uh, that follow the well architected framework for deploying certain um, resources. So this could be like, what is the best uh, secure way to deploy, um, for example, an API gateway with Lambda and a backend? Um, and that, that, that's an example that we actually use within our CDK, uh, as well as how about API gateway with SQS, which is something else we are uh, we used uh, to pr uh, provision the, these resources. So it, it allows users to be comfortable and know it's secure when they're utilizing some of these constructs, um, and they don't necessarily have to know the ins and outs of how these things are uh, created. They just need to know, okay, I know this is actually vetted by AWS uh, Solutions Architects, and um, I feel confident about using it. So, uh, and, and really though, um, uh, with with these constructs, it actually allows us to define them locally and then also publish them to package managers. So you can have it in things like NPM, Maven, NuGet, and PyPy uh, to share across organizations or across um, your community. And uh, it allows you to take advantage of a whole slew of, of cool uh, constructs. And like I said, the AWS solutions constructs um, uh, currently available in, in the library, and I'll share this link uh, as well. Um, but it, it, you can you can see a full list of all of the uh, available constructs to you from provided from us. Okay. So this. The uh, UI-based migration, um, we wanted the user to interact with a website. Now that website should be able to pre present the user with all the necessary information to perform an action um, of the migration. Now, uh, we wanted that migration, or we wanted that front end um, to be fairly simple, um, as well as provide some sort of authentication um, and then uh, direct the user to an embedded QuickSight 
page that is then able to draw in a certain amount of uh, information from their environment. And then also, when you click Submit, performs a specific migration of the resources that the user specifies. So what does that really look like? Well, here we have our central account. Um, and Bomsi showed you what that central account uh, looked like just earlier. But uh, we have deployed um, a set of resources. Now, if you look at the bottom, we have our CloudFront distribution with Lambda at Edge, which actually performs the authentication and authorization for us. Currently, it's just a, a basic authentication. So we, we, we provide you um, a simple um, Lambda function in written in uh, JavaScript. All it does is, hey, give me uh, basic authentication, authentication credentials um, in, in this file. And then I will make sure the user that's connecting to my distribution um, URL has to enter those before they can proceed to the website that's stored in our S3 bucket, which is what you see up, up in the middle there where it says embedded dashboard website. Now the dashboard website needs to be able to embed, sorry, the the uh, HTML page has to be able to embed a, a frame um, that we actually get from um, QuickSight. So what we, we get an embedded URL. Um, and with IAM authentication, it goes and performs this action. Anytime a user uh, goes to this site, it goes and gets an embedded um, URL, and then uh, that which actually expires after a short time. So it's not active all the time. It, so gets it, presents it to the user. Um, that dashboard is actually populated uh, separately off to the left here um, with dashboard information, or it, dashboard and analysis and theme and data set, data source information from our environment. And how is that really provided? Well, from our QuickSight API, we can actually glean a a lot of that information uh, pretty easily. So we have a Lambda function that, that is routinely run um, periodically about every 15 minutes in our environment. And what that does is it says, hey, describe me all these, um, all these things for me that are available to me in my account. And currently, we're only doing that in our central account. Um, but this could easily be extended to say, hey, I know I have these sets of accounts. In, and I have resources in these regions, I just need to be able to assume a role from this Lambda function in this account to all my target accounts, go get the necessary information and uh, populate that into an S3, S3 bucket as a uh, JSON file or a CSV file um, periodically. And then we have, with just that, we have a, a collection of status up there, collection of uh, data that presents us a very pretty up-to-date uh, view in what all we have across our environment. Um, and and thus, that's, that's basically all we wanted to present to the user. Now the refresh rate is uh, slower because we aren't, uh, we didn't, we aren't forcing our quick set refreshes often enough. However, um, we found it uh, uh, sufficient to do it at an hourly um, interval. And so that's what we have in our uh, website here. And furthermore, we want to be able to communicate with um, uh, our backend uh, Lambda functions to perform the actual migration. Now, I want to be able to, when a user inputs a certain set of parameters, I want to capture those parameters and store it somewhere so when my Lambda is ready, it will go process it. Now I have a gateway, API gateway here. And I, I for, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention our API gateway up here, uh, which is what we use to communicate to get our embedded URL to actually embed that uh, dashboard in our uh, frame within our HTML page. Similarly, we have a gateway here, which allows us to perform the migration itself. What it really does is it takes a set of parameters in a JSON, um, uh, uh, as JSON, sends it to an SQSQ, then our Lambda function is triggered when there is a message in our queue. Now, our Lambda function knows how to handle all the different parameters, and it just grabs it 
and then uh, uh, parses it and determines what kind of migration it needs to do, what kind of, uh, what set of resources it needs to migrate, as well as um, uh, uh, which accounts and which regions it needs to do that to. Um, the cool thing is, because this is a central account and uh, the way we've set up our CDK is when we deploy resources, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment, when we deploy our uh, IAM roles in our target accounts, it allows our migration lambda here to assume the necessary roles in the target accounts to perform the, the migration. And if we look over here, this is kind of this is what our architecture currently looks like, and this may this most likely won't be identical to uh, a customer's uh, customer's um, architecture, or possibly not even close. But we wanted to highlight how you could utilize our CDK to provision test uh, Redshift, Aurora, and uh, potentially Athena, like uh, Bomsi showed you. So to our left here, we have our central account, which um, which has three different stacks, and these are cloud formation stacks that are provisioned by CDK. The uh, individual stacks uh, make up our um, uh, complete architect or uh, infrastructure. On our QuickSight embed stack, as you saw off to the left here, um, this makes up a, a decent bit of this. Uh, uh, we, this list of resources here. What what it allows us to do is um, gives us our CloudFront distribution, provisions our authorization lambda at edge, um, gives us a, a, a role to allow the embed URL lambda to work, um, gives us a API gateway which we we use to communicate with the backend URL lambda, embed URL lambda to get our embedded lambda or uh, embedded URL from QuickSight that is short-lived. Um, and then a website, or sorry, S3 bucket that hosts our index.html uh, uh, file, which we connect to. Um, and then our QuickSight migration stack uh, will provision our migration um, gateway, uh, API gateway, our SUSQ, um, and our migration lambda. And th this just facilitates just the migration portion of, of, of the um, uh, process. And finally, um, we also have our QuickSight status stack. Now this uh, will do the periodic checking of our environment, stores it into the S3 bucket, which then we grab and present to the user as a dashboard. Um, and uh, uh, and in our target accounts, and we only provision one for this um, workshop, um, we want we wanted to present to users what it would look like if they were to have an Aurora Postgres um, with, along with a Redshift cluster um, provisioned in their target accounts. So we in our central account we have those two things. In our target account we have those two things. We have data. Uh, corresponding data in both things. Um, and then we wanted to highlight how, what, what, would, what would it look like if we transferred that over. So that's why we have a VPC provisioned here um, uh, with these two clusters, along with our InfraStack. And what this InfraStack actually provides us is this, we, we needed to, uh, Vamsi pointed this out in, in his notebook. There, there was a cell where you had to input a several parameters to indicate I need to uh, 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 provide a RDS cluster ID. I need to provide the Redshift cluster ID. I need to provide it some credentials. I need to provide it all these other infrastructure related configuration values that need to be set for us to perform that migration. Well, um, we found it that it might be easier to actually do that if we stuck it in um, our uh, systems manager parameter store. So what we do is when we provision all these resources in our optional infrastructure stack, we output a lot of these values. And I'll show you what that looks like in CloudFormation. But we output a, a lot of these values 
take those values uh, and put those put those values into our parameter store. And this would occur in all of our target accounts. So each target account would, uh, as expected, would have a different cluster ID, different credentials to access their databases. So we would want uh, a different parameter each time. And then um, finally, we have this assume role, which allows us our migration lambda to assume to perform the necessary actions, such as checking the inf uh, uh, config parameter or uh, quick site permissions or the secrets manager to find out the credentials of our um, uh, databases. So that's uh, that's what the overall architecture looks like. Uh, so let me show you what that um, looks like from first from the CDK side, and then I'll go into the console to show what it looks like there. So let me make sure this is large enough to be visible. Okay, so I have two tabs here. One is our target tab, one is our central tab. So with CDK, um, we have CDK locally installed. And if, if uh, any of this is new to you, I highly recommend going to the CDK workshop. It goes through um, how to provision simple, uh, or how to set up your environment to uh, actually use CDK, as well as how do I deploy some simple uh, resources to get you started. So we, we, we have two sets of accounts. Um, in order, it's similar to how uh, VOMC had to input um, uh, AWS profiles in one of the cells. We need to have um, uh, profiles in order to interact with our accounts with CDK. So with the use of CDK doctor, I can actually see, um, as you could see that I've set my environment variables to a specific default profile. For this uh, EOC, we did QS Central, that's my account, that's my region, um, and uh, actually, and similarly, on the other side, in my other shell, I have the QS target, that account ID, and that region that I'd like to deploy to. So back here, um, We have we have our app.py, which actually has the collection of all the stacks that we want to uh, be or that are available to us to deploy uh, it into whatever uh, account that we specify. So, uh, and these are CloudFormation stacks. So, if we do CDK LS, we'll see. It's a little slow. So as you can see, I have the opportunity to deploy five different stacks. Um, and these correspond to our, uh, our sorry. Um, these correspond to these five different stacks that uh, are in this architecture diagram. Um, with, within our central account, we wanted to have the quick site embed we want to have the quick site migration and the quick site status stacks deployed there. Um, in our target, you'll uh, likewise see that there are uh, target in, um, in, in the names. Um, the, I, I will not perform the uh, deployment of all these stacks because it actually, uh, it takes a while, especially when we're trying to deploy our uh, backend infrastructure such as Redshift or RDS, it, uh, it, it will, 20, 30, 40 minutes, uh, depending on how, how large that cluster is. So, uh, but we can see, for example, and the, and the great thing about CDK uh, is that if there haven't been changes, and this is actually a fu uh, the functionality of CloudFormation, if there haven't been any changes to the environment or your, um, your templates, it actually doesn't perform any changes. So we could potentially just do, actually, let's see. We could potentially just do CDK deploy 
our embed stack that we've already deployed to, and I haven't made changes uh, since um, we uh, set up our environment yesterday. As you can see, there were no changes. It actually didn't do anything. However, it does output things. Um, and these outputs are from outputs that you specify within the code itself or from the constructs that uh, default to uh, output certain values for you to make it easier for you to uh, see what, what was actually provisioned. But what's great is, um, oh, I'm sorry. What's great is if we go to CloudFormation um, and we go to our central account, as you can see, it, sends those, it says central up here. Um, we have those three. We have those three provisioned. Let's look at our outputs tab. It, it outputs those values here as well. Um, what we provisioned though um, are all the resources that were in that uh, diagram. Um, and most importantly, it provisions those API gateway uh, gateways for us, the two that uh, facilitate the communication to our backend from our front end. Now, the uh, oh, these two is what I'm pointing at here. Now, once we do provision these these two, those IDs are given to us, and then we want to make that those two IDs available to the end user with the use of uh, with the use of an HTML page. So what we do is we actually upload a file. Apologize, it's small. Oops. And in our quick site embed, we have this HTML uh, Dot, uh, index.html file. Now, if we actually go back to our code base, what does that look like? So this is the uh, repository that you uh, link that you saw uh, under the CDK directory. Um, we have this index.html page that takes two inputs from us as uh, when we first provision it. The uh, URL for the gateway that performs the actual migration. And then secondarily, the URL for the embedding gateway. And both these outputs are provided for us in, um, sorry, uh, in our cloud formation. Uh, our embed, uh, sorry, our, our embed URL, and then our, uh, our migration URL. Uh, oops. Once we once we've been able to update those, we upload that to our embed um, uh, uh, S3 bucket, and then that now is available for us to navigate to from our uh, CloudFormation distribution, which actually is provided to us here under our QuickSight embed stack. the The CloudFormation distribution. Um, provisions that Lambda, the Lambda that is at edge, this Lambda takes input from the user um, when we're first provisioning the stacks himself. Um, the idea is this is just a basic authentication. However, um, most enterprise uh, customers wouldn't necessarily just want basic authentication in front of their uh, private, private uh, website. So, one one uh, alternative would be to use Cognito in, in place of this. But for this uh, um, POC, all it really does is take, hey, give me a username, give me a password, and then the Lambda, once deployed, will accept those two credentials. And then, then um, takes that as an input in front of the CloudFront, um, or it, from CloudFront to authenticate you to back end. Um, and furthermore, with our uh, migration gateway, uh, we have the SQS queue. So if we go to our migration stack, 
we provision um, a bucket for us. We provision the role um, that you saw in the diagram. Um, the, oh, sorry, the, uh, sorry, the role <laughs> um, and the policy. And then more importantly, what we have down here, which is um, the construct that we're going to be using. This provisions the gateway for us. It uh, sets up the cores, um, uh, 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 pre-flight options for us automatically. Um, it provisions the SQS queue for us and also tells SQS uh, to, or when it's given, when it's given a, a a message from the front end to go and trigger our Lambda function that uh, handles the actual migration itself. So as you can see, our event source um, is right here. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, our event source is right here. And that that hooks our SQSQ and our Lambda function together to perform that, um, to perform that migration. So we have their embed stack there. Um, and finally, we have our status. No, sorry, uh, status stack. And uh, similar to the other stack, we have our S3 bucket. Um, this is where our uh, this is where our, our CSV file lives that provides us um, status of our environment to the user and which we then utilize in, in QuickSight, but it, it periodically runs the um, Lambda function due to this event rule. And every hour it runs the, and we can run this uh, much more frequently, um, but um, for the purposes of this, we just ran it every hour. It uh, queries a uh, QuickSight API and then outputs that file to that bucket uh, and makes it available to us. Um, and show you what that looks like uh, with uh, what Vomsi built. Um, and then in our target accounts, um, let me go here. In our target account, um, we wanted to uh, show what it would look like if you were to deploy um, Redshift and RDS, um, both of which are uh, pretty fairly well secured and also utilize um, VPC endpoints um, to traverse the traffic specifically to the VPC rather than over the internet. So both of these resources are within a VPC, have a, a VPC endpoint uh, provision in QuickSight and they'll, all the traffic goes through there. Um, and depending on, the, uh, obviously this is not required for you as customer to uh, use, uh, but this is just an example of how you would provision that. And um, if you did did have these resources, this is how you could um, build it with CDK. And what this also provides us is an output um, in our target with a set of um, output values that we'll use as input values for our migration. What, for the clusters we we just built, um, we get things like um, usernames, uh, password. This is actually just a password that, uh, password name of a secrets manager password, or a secret, sorry, secrets manager secret, which then we handle from our migration Lambda, we actually go seek uh, that secret, determine what the password is, then then pass that into uh, the rest of the workflow. We don't actually wanna keep the password available here, or even when we provision from CDK, don't want that in our code base. Um, along with it, uh, once we get these, um, uh, these parameters, we actually use those as input to provision our infrastructure. And that will create our SSM parameter with the necessary values that will then be used within our Lambda function to perform the migration to this account. Okay. So, um, I'm through all of that. So, 
So let's let's see what that looks like um, from our front end. I'll just go over it before I hand it over to Vamsi to take a look at the the um, the migration portion. So our CloudFront distribution provides us uh, the mechanism to display that embedded dashboard. And every time we actually perform the uh, we perform a refresh on this. Um, it goes and fetches a uh, temporary embedded URL, and then um, due to due to um, a specific setting within QuickSight, and I'll show you what that looks like. It allows us to uh, it allows us to embed that website. So um, as you can see here, we have uh, under our uh, settings and domains and embedding, um, we need to be able to uh, allow a domain outside from the outside to be able to query and sorry, to be able to show this embedded website. And so we actually need to allow the platform distribution that we created and allow it to use any subdomains because we do have a subdomain um, uh, or we may have a subdomain. Um, and so you would add this, and at which point it would actually allow you to embed it within our website. Otherwise, you would see um, errors about uh, not being able to, um, uh, you're not a allowed to embed um, uh, from different domains outside of uh, QuickSight. So from that, um, we provide you statuses of the uh, environment from the central account, and you'll see that the account ID matches my account ID in our central account, as well as the region, um, and then the object type. Now, the ideally, what this would show me is not only my um, my source; it would show me all of my account resources. But we would want that. We would want that query to happen frequently, and we would want that to happen to all of our target accounts with the assumed role from the status, uh, embedded status, um, um, uh, migration, or sorry, embedded, or sorry, the status uh, stack, and which would then go get all the information for us, keep us up to date about all of our resources, and then we can perform our migrations from that. Um, and then at the bottom here, um, you see a migration tool and this is um, fairly simply created uh, with HTML and some, um, JavaScript but it really just gives us the opportunity to select the different kinds of migrations um, apply the different um, parameters for source um, account ID source region target ID target account ID target region as well as the kind of resources if we're if we decide to do the incremental um, like we saw earlier um, we could we could say uh, let's see we could say incremental analysis dashboard theme um, we will be adding um, data set and data source here as well and then you could provide a list of items that you would want to migrate now, when you do mi do certain migrations, for example, if you want to do um, dashboards, we will migrate the underlying um, resources for you, uh, like Lamsi said, uh, similar to uh, analysis. Um, but ultimately, like you may want, um, you may want to just be able to migrate a data source, for instance. So we we will be adding that functionality here as well. Um, that's going to be made available in the GitHub. Okay. Um, Vamsi, would you like to perform some changes to the dashboard and then we could show what that would look like for in the back end? Yep, yep, you can share my screen. Like, 
Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see it. Okay, cool. So as part of this uh, demo, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do certain changes to our source account. Uh, say, for example, I will change analysis and publish it as a dashboard in the source account. That means basically the analysis and dashboards are changed. And then we will go to the uh, the front end cloud front URL, which I opened already here. And we're going to input those parameters here and submit it to see if the migration happens to the target account. So before I go ahead do and do that, uh, quickly two things I want to talk about is first is the, the dashboard which we kept in place. So the dashboard status here. So this is in the source account. And as Sam explained, uh, right now it is only showing the source uh, account stuff along with all the different objects what we have which we know like the uh, the object analysis us population these are all the different analysis dashboards data sets whatever we have in the source account it is showing up here and this is the exact dashboard which actually embedded into the front end url so in the cloud front url you are seeing the same dashboard here and uh, the second thing is uh, as sam explained uh, in case of the notebook solution you are giving the credentials into the notebook Whereas in case of this CDK solution, uh, the credentials are actually in the secret manager. So, uh, so if in case, if your case, you are using the optional stack, as Sam explained, which actually deploys the Redshift and RDLs, then it automatically builds those secrets for you. But otherwise, in the target account, uh, if you go to the secrets manager in the target account, uh, if in case you have existing RDS or RDS, you have to make sure that uh, you create the secrets in the uh, secret manager. So in AWS, there is something called a secret manager. Uh, and once you open that, and if you click on the secrets, um, then you should see that uh, the secrets are something you can mention over here. So you can actually uh, gonna mention the, the Redshift uh, username and password. And same way for RDS, you're gonna do the same thing. So there will be two secrets here, one for Redshift, one for RDS, which you need to create if in case you didn't do, but if you have the infrastructure already set up in your target account. So said that if you have uh, all these credentials in place, uh, the, pretty much all the code what uh, Sam walked through, it's all like part of the uh, GitHub. So you, the only thing you need to change probably is a couple of input parameters, uh, which, he, which he explained. Now let's do certain changes in the source account. So let's go to the source account. And in the source account, uh, I will go ahead and do certain changes uh, to one of the uh, analysis. Say, for example, if I take the web social analytics, and I'm going to add maybe let's say I add a new sheet and just uh, form some new visualization and I'll add another I'm just randomly form some two visualizations here basically okay so I got sheet 11 and sheet 12 with some visualizations in place so it means something I changed in my dev account now I'm going to publish this as a uh, same existing dashboard and I just publish it it can be a new object but for now I'm just going with the same uh, dashboard name so it can be a new brand new analysis or it can be a uh, existing object doesn't matter so both will be considered as incremental migration so in our case we change the analysis and also we change the dashboard now we want to do this migration so we will go to the cloud front url that's something which is showing up here and let me zoom a bit So, okay, it's too much zoom, <laughs> let me minimize a bit. Okay, so basically in this, you have batch or incremental two kind of migrations, and you're gonna provide your source account from where you wanna migrate, and what is the region, and same, you're gonna provide the target stuff. And then if it is a batch, then it won't let you to uh, fill in the, what resource you want to migrate, being batch is like complete migration, you're doing it. But for this lab, we're gonna do incremental, so I'll go with incremental migration. And when it is incremental, then it lets you to give the object name, what you want to make it, object type. And also you can give a comma separate of those items. So in our case, uh, this is my source. So I'm going to take my source account. And I'm going to uh, mention my region, that's US East 1. And for the target, let's take the target account from here. So I take in my target account and target region is same as US East 1 in my case. And then I migrated, I mean, I've changed basically the analysis, right? So I'll pick up the analysis as my migration resource and I will mention the actual uh, one which I changed that is web social analysis. So these are, 
and also which are changed. So before I trigger uh, submit, I'll go ahead and verify one time in my target account for the analysis web social it says like an hour ago it got changed and um, if i go to that i see only one sheet available right now in the target account and now let's go ahead and trigger the migration and it's going to prompt you and you're going to click ok for that now uh, the, the actually in the back end the uh, you know the process might have kicked off so we can actually go ahead and verify here let's go here so as we trigger an analysis migration, and that means it actually go ahead and do all the job. So for example, if you, uh, uh, let's go to the data sets. So you see this data set, web social analytics. So it's kind of migrated like a few seconds back. So it actually triggered the migration for the dependent objects as well, not just for the analysis. That way they both are in sync. And if you go to the analysis, even that says like a few seconds ago change it now, right? And if I go to that web social analytics, you can see like the sheet 11 and sheet 12, which we added just now, uh, those are coming up. So it's kind of an easy migration for you, a click button away, like you just click the, you just use certain input parameters and click in that in that uh, CloudFront URL. And in this case, we are not even giving the credentials. Those are all managed in the secret manager. And you got the migration done for the object. Now, similarly, like uh, if I go and do the data, data dashboard migration, so let's go back and give this time as a dashboard which we changed, that's uh, web social analytics dashboard. This one we changed. So I'm gonna change this with this web social analytics dashboard. And if you have multiple, you can give a comma separate, comma separate list and give as a dashboard this time. And rest of the things are pretty much the same. I need not touch anything. So click on submit and click okay. Now this time, if you go back to this, again, it's dependent objects like data sets, everything you're gonna get migrated one more time. So going to the data set, this again changed a few seconds ago, the data set got changed. Analysis is not gonna change this time, but whereas the dashboard should change. See the dashboard changed a few seconds ago. And if you go to the dashboard, you can see that you got the sheet 11 and sheet 12. Yep, those are migrated now and it's a different data so you will see different different kind of uh, visualization here but it's, it's just because of you have different data sets in both dev and product accounts so that's uh, the cloud front url by using this you're going to migrate so two couple of things to keep in mind is one is uh, the, if in case you have a existing rds and redshift as i told you should make sure like you have entered those credentials in the secret manager in the target account and second is uh, if in case uh, you are actually using the optional track, uh, optional stack, which we may not use most of the times because you might have the uh, server all set up in the target account already. But if you use the optional stack, then uh, then those secret managers uh, will create automatically. And second thing is uh, the changes in terms of uh, we performed in the account, in the source account. It need not to be an existing object. It can be a brand new object. Like you can create an analysis, a brand new analysis, and you can just mention that name as well here for the migration. Then it automatically do that migration for you. Yep, that's said the demo for this uh, CDK solution. Uh, I'll take a pause here for any questions. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, well, yeah. first let me let me just go over what that looked like in the back end. So um, yep. just give a bit more context. Um, so let me change to myself um <clears throat> so when momsi actually clicked submit what that did was it sent a message to sqs and sqs um uh, provided uh, given given that message it triggered our lambda function our uh quick site lambda uh quick site migration lambda in our central account um and if we go to what that looks like uh, from the logs. Uh, his first uh, his first submission um, was uh, let's go actually change the or uh, let's go migrate incrementally migrate the web social analytics analysis. And because of that, we know our uh, we know what uh, connection that we have or the VPC connection um, as well as the underlying data set that we also have to update. Um, so we attempt 
to create that data set. We, we know we were able to do that successfully. Um, there weren't any themes that we had to worry about that didn't already exist. And we also want to, uh, we know that the analysis already does exist. So all we'd really want to do is make sure we update it to the relevant uh, version. And uh, finally, we, since we've done, done all of this successfully, um, we're, we're going to make sure the SQS queue is cleaned up because that message will just stay there unless for a certain amount of retention time. So we'll, we want to go and clean ourselves up. So it, that's what it does find, uh, at the very end there. And uh, then he followed that up with doing the dashboard migration. Um, and similarly, we want, we want to know what that data set looks like. We want to know the um, uh, if there are any themes that we need to update. So uh, we actually had our data. We had our dashboard already created. Um, so what we're doing here, instead of um, just updating it, we're just going to recreate the dashboard for you um, to the newest version, and then follows that up with uh, deleting the message from the SQS queue. Um, so th that's sort of what it looks like from the back end for just the migration piece. Um, and then the embedded was pretty straightforward. All it did was reach out to um, our Lambda. Lambda went out to QuickSight API got that embed URL, passed it right back to the user, and then I can view that web page. And that was that's about it. Um, do we have any specific questions around the CDK before we move on to the general questions? Yeah, there's a couple of questions. Um, one question, where can we find the migration tool? Uh, yeah. Do we have a link that we're sharing on that? Yeah, the, um, let's see, the CDK directory within the Amazon QuickSight SDK Parser is where we have that. So let me share that uh, here. As part of the deployment, uh, you're going to get a Cloudflare URL, and that's the URL you're going to use it for your purpose. That That's the tool, basically. And yeah, and, and regarding this, uh, we, we do have uh, a, uh, blog post coming up with um, very detailed instructions on how to provision each of these things, um, specifically the CDK, um, and then goes over each resource, uh, uh, each resource that's being provisioned um, with the solution. Yeah, and just for your information, um, when you just deploy the CDK, uh, the dashboard, uh, I mean the dashboard of the dashboards in the embedded uh, session, it might be empty uh, because we set up the hourly schedule to let the lambda function to get the uh, QuickSight object information. Uh, if you would like to see the information display in the embedded dashboard, you might have to manually uh, invoke the lambda function for the first time to get the data to be displayed there. Yeah, and um, I see Brian Cho asked a question, and it is a great question. Um, we have to separate the um, migration into different stages. When we talk about migration, uh, we have those data warehouse objects, and we also have those BI objects migration. For the matching a single table name view in two different accounts, it should be handled by the ETL step um, because it's very easy to use the uh, SQL DDL to create a table or update a table with the same name in the two accounts instead of we keep the different names in different accounts and then we modify in the BI migration step. That's not a good approach. We should make make sure the table name, the view name, they are matching in the two different accounts. And then we can run the BI object migration. And if we you play with the two, you will see when you do the describe data set API, the return JSON body will have one part called custom SQL. And then the SQL we are using for the data set, it is like a, a stream uh, there existing in the uh, custom SQL uh, section. Um, and if we would like to update those custom SQL, of course it's doable. You can use 
uh, Python uh, JSON string resolving and then replaced, find the corresponding table name and update the SQL uh, into the one you would like to use, the new table name in Target Code. But that's not the best practice we recommend. We always recommend use ETL to make sure your table migrated correctly with the correct schema and correct table name. And then you kick off the BI migration, which focuses on the BI objects instead of touch the SQL query inside the data set. That's not we are recommending. Hopefully you can answer your question. Oh, yeah, and just I mean, just to add to that, if, if I read that question right, uh, if the table names and view names are matching uh, between two accounts uh, for Athena, yes, then uh, it automatically the data source will repoint to the target uh, when we migrate it. If, if they're not matching, yeah, that's not a best practice. Like, there's no way we can identify like what could be a table here. Uh, then I uh, would make sure like your ETL side, those are matching. But ideally, if they are matching, yes, it will automatically repoint to the target account when it migrates uh, for running that job. Yeah, thank you, Lance. Yeah, exactly. The, that's what we are doing. Yeah. And if there's no any further question, uh, Jill, do you want to close the session for us? Thank you. I see one last question from Mary um, that yeah. I, I'd like to address really quickly, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Mary, you, you certainly can use uh, Terraform. Um, really, all of the CDK that's written here um just interacts with our aws api so i know terraform is pretty up to date with that so you can provision all these resources exactly the same with terraform it just needs to be rewritten in those templates that's all yeah and just add to this question actually we have other customers they are using uh, terraform to do all the uh, deployment uh, Mary, if you would like to understand the detail, please contact Jill. Um, I can organize a session uh, between you and the uh, uh, POC of the other customer, and you can exchange your ideas. Uh, yeah, just for information. Fantastic. That's that's a great addition. Thank you so much for both uh, asking the question and to the team for answering it. That's super helpful. And again, um, I have put this link in the field in the, the chat window, but uh, whether you're uh, sharing feedback or connecting with us for future live workshops, hopefully this was a great use of your time today. And thank you so much to the professional services team from AWS who are doing such great work and sharing uh, best practices in this way. So uh, with that, I think I'll, uh, close up the session for today. And as I mentioned, we'll have this posted to the QuickSight YouTube channel uh, by the end of the week.